A few days ago, we showed you part one of the VTI lecture that Taryn Trot was nice enough to share with me and us. And now it's part two of that same interview where we actually talk about the ultrasound specifics. Check it out and let me know what you think. So this is an ultrasound talk. That's where we talk about the aortic velocity time integral. And if, we, if this is the first time you're hearing about this, your brain is like, what the heck are these words? We're going to break it down. Um, Love it. Learning flying is learning to throw yourself at the ground, miss. Great ultrasound. <laughs> So that 61, let's take an example from fellowship that I still remember. 61-year-old male, has a history of COPD, heart failure, has osteomyelitis of the foot. This person was drowsy, had an increased work of breathing. Their blood pressure is soft, heart rate's normal, respiratory rate's up, and they're a little hypoxic. Uh, but they're definitely working hard to breathe. Lactate comes back at 5.6, creatinine is elevated, and I got consulted for sepsis. Hey, do you think this patient needs that to be That seems appropriate. Uh, there's something going on. There's something right. going on. There's no doubt. And lacta every lactate has to be sepsis, of course. So, you know, we do a little bedside scanning. And I can say, yeah, you know, I mean, that doesn't look that great. <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, there's, there might be sepsis, but. But there's probably something else going on here, too. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's EF, which is okay. A lot of people out in the world have low EFs and they're at the grocery right. store right now. It's probably mm -hmm. because their stroke volume is compensated. They're, they're compensated in enough ways. So we say very low EF. And the question is, what kind of shock is this? And of course, what am I doing for my patient? And that may mean ionotropes. It may mean ionodilators, right? If they're an RV failure mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. Do they need to do fluids or do I need to do nothing? The answer is... Get <laughs> That's how I'm going to help decide what to do with this patient. So let's get even more granular. What is stroke volume? It's your end diastolic volume versus your end systolic volume. And the way we think about it when it comes to ultrasound and calculating is that we think about it as a column, like geometry, column of blood. Mm -hmm. Now, a column, volume of column, we're, we're taking it back, has a calculation. It's your area of the circle portion times the length. Your area is going to be represented by your aortic outflow track. And the length is your veloc aortic velocity time integral, which we have the units Makes of sense. Sense. So when we look at these, we see them on the long axis. We're taking our column. We're mm -hmm. imposing where we think we're, where it exists in our echoes. And we're going to use our long axis. We're going to use our five chamber. A couple steps to get the actual measurement. So bear with me. Mm -hmm. Number one is you're going to measure the diameter of the outflow track. So in your long axis view, you're going to measure it during systole. You're going to measure right below the valve. Two, we get a five chamber view. That's a beautiful five chamber view. We got our septum. Is it proximal to the valve? Sorry. Yeah, you said yeah. below. Do you mean exactly. proximal to the yeah, valve? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So like in the LV side, just mm -hmm. before the valve starts. Nailed it. And then we're going to get our five chamber view, which I like to say the four chamber view is the best, but truthfully, it's the five chamber. We're going to align our Doppler with the outflow track. Bam. Again, right proximal to the valve. And we're going to hit that pulse wave Doppler button again, and we're going to trace the envelope. What does that mean? Well, we get this signal. And yeah, you're going to have to have a little familiarity with how, how to get a good pulse wave um, signal. But what we see here is that we have a nice hollow envelope, right? So it's a crisp outline with uh, less signal in the middle. We want our angle of incidence less than 20%. This is true for all things in echocardiography, meaning if the blood's flowing this way, we want mm -hmm. to actually measure this the same way. The same so that way. would be like zero degrees, right? If we're like yeah. directly on it. But so you don't want more than a 20 degree difference between flow and your Doppler angle. That's right. And of Got course, the, the, you're, if you get off, your signal will be lower. You're underestimating. Mm -hmm. As you approach, you're going to get better, closer to the true value. Larger values, most accurate. That's going to be the case uh, for um, your VTI. I like to repeat and average our values. And this is, we were kind of talking about using the auto function. I was using it this morning in a hands-on session mm -hmm. and it got me like 14 VTIs that all look traced pretty well. And I'm like, that's going to be more that's, accurate. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to become a fan. Normal. I'm almost hesitant to put this up here as 18 to 24 for VTI. It does depend on your, you know, diameter and there's a lot of permutations. We're really looking for extremes, right? So less than 15, greater than 25, something like that.
I'm going to take a brief pause here and remind you about the Ultrasound Leadership Academy. That's ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com. Check it out for a year-long ultrasound fellowship where we get to do image review, one-on-one hangouts, and of course, a year-long curriculum. We definitely have a way to kind of parse it out if you want to kind of pick and choose what part of it that you like. And now, back to the video. The stroke bomb. Oh, here it comes. Ah, there's a symbol. What is that? It's like a, it's the bridge symbol. I don't know what that means. Oh, man. Okay, so we can calculate this, right? We can put this in. We can get the actual stroke volume. We can get the actual cardiac output by, you know, t- multiplying by heart rate. We can put this all together and we know this is just too much, right? This is too we, much. Yes. Yeah, that's that's what my answer to that equation is as well. Yeah. It's too exhausting. much math. I get exhausted even saying it, let alone someone trying to look at these slides and be like, oh, let me take these notes down right, real quick. Right. So you don't need it. You need the aortic VTI as an intrinsically valid value. It's going to be reproducible for that patient. Can you necessarily translate from one patient to another? There's too many variables. There's too many variables. Mm -hmm. Ballparks, sure. Specific, probably not. That's where we're going to assume all other variables are constant. The VTI is directly proportional to stroke volume. It's not like a to the fourth power pi you know, negative I squared, whatever, it's directly proportional. So let's get back to the case of the uh, the patient from fellowship. I saw this stuff. I said, you know, I see a bad EF, but I want to know what's the VTI? Because what if it's high? Mm-hmm. What if it's normal? Right. What if it's low? Right. Well, no surprise. This one is pretty low. Ooh. Here's a number of 5.6. I know that's low. I don't Weak. need to reference. It's bad. So that's dobutamine at zero. I bump mm-hmm. it up to five. I'm bedside. I'm doing You're using dobutamine as a single presser as a single agent. Yeah. And then I see the blood. Oh, not, sorry, not blood pressure, but I see the VTI start to climb my repeat value. I mean, you can see him serially here goes up. Mm-hmm. I go up to 10. Wow. I'm getting a 12. I go up from 10 to 15 and my VTI is 18.8. It's a beautiful crisp VTI. I trust it. I love right? that. If, it, if I got a bad yeah. signal, I might not it's use just, it. It's just so hollow on the inside that it's like oh. the most perfectest VTI. Like congratulations on getting this hollow of an envelope. It is like yeah. impressive actually. Like I, I'm looking at this envelope and I know that from the beginning, I should have just been focusing on how small the VTI was. Um, you know, which is you correlate to the stroke volume, but all I can think about is how perfect the med- the, the ten microgram one is. is it's not the best, <laughs> but look at your, yeah. your your beginning one. You're five. You're fifteen. Like, oh, I'm uh, I'm enamored. <laughs> um, and you know, it's an important point. If you're not getting a good signal, maybe this yeah. is not the test for this patient. You know what I mean? Agreed. Agreed. You choose your test when it when it's appropriate. So this patient got put on dobutamine, aggressively diuresed, lactate completely cured, mental status improved, I was on BiPAP, came off BiPAP. Like this is what this person needed. They needed room right. for the heart to squeeze better. And so like imagine just giving that, that patient a bunch of fluids, like more fluids, right? I mean, those right. are, you know, Ooh, like, that would have been it, rough. It, I think that would have been, that would have, he would have died. Say the ultrasound for the win. That's another life saving. There you go. An literally. Ultrasound. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm looking at an individual VTI and then I am did my intervention, I look for a mm-hmm. response of greater than 20. I give myself a little more uh, specificity, a little less sensitivity. That's because I know there's some margin of error when I trace. So instead of the 15, like a lot of the literature, I use 20 to each their own. You can use a, your VTI in respirophasic variation, right? That's your stroke mm-hmm. volume variation. So we can increase our sweep speed, look at a bunch of VTIs. So on the left, we're looking at maximum velocities of the VTI, mm-hmm. and we're seeing this big variation with respirations. This person needed some fluids. They got fluids. So this is, this is separate than the VTI though, right? I mean, this is just looking at peak velocity? Yeah, this is just looking at peak velocity of the, um, blo- of the outflow, of the aortic outflow right. blood. Yeah, so there's multiple ways to kind of use... Great. The point being, there's multiple ways to kind of use this. Here's a case where we saw a big variation with respirations, gave mm-hmm. some fluids, variability decrease, patient was responsive. Brilliant. So lots of different utilities. Um, you can do RV, VTI, 
LVVTIs. Um, we see things like response to PCI. So patients who have low VTI before they get stented mm -hmm. and they continue to have low VTI, they do worse. Not really surprising, yeah. right? They have low, yeah. low cardiac function. So it, it just makes sense. There's a very um, fundamental piece of the puzzle, in my opinion. Uh, response to pulmonary vasodilators. I have someone on RV failure. I think epoprostenol is the right answer. I get an RV VTI. It's depressed. I put mm -hmm. on the epoprostenol. My RV VTI goes up. I see a response. Wait, hold on. So an RV VTI, you would be doing the same thing, but presumably from a basal or short axis view into the pulmonary artery? Yeah, that's a, that's probably my favorite. And you can also do the RV outflow view from the long axis. Oh, okay. All right. Brilliant. Love it. And that, um, I, I have less success with that one. It's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Actually, both of them are tough. Yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, I'd like to leave this with, there's this killer ultrasound <gasps> resource. Oh, it's the old logo. I need the new logo. It's okay. It's okay. I'll replace it in the in the post processing. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, I hope that kind of frames a, a picture of you know how we're using differentiated shock, how we're using it in clinical cases and stuff like that. I think it's super super important. It does. It does take practice. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But is that okay? Well, this is the water. The, listen, that is the uh, most simplest, like easiest to follow, like reasoning and then how to do it and then how to use it that I've seen. And we got through a complex topic in like 20 minutes, I feel like. And kudos to you, number one. Um, number two, I did have a specific question for you with regards to like how this is utilized clinically. So um, one of the things that I think I struggle with is um, getting the pulse wave Doppler image, a uh, gate, in the same spot with every fluid challenge. Because what you're doing is you're measuring the VTI, then giving fluids, then measuring it again. And you basically keep going until you stop seeing that variation or that increase of 20%, right? right. Um, but if you have the same patient at the same time, let's say like this is like the channel of flow, right? Um, well, here, let's do the phone. This is the channel of flow. You measure your first one here and your second one done like two seconds later, you measure it accidentally out here. You're gonna get a 20% change if you if sure? not more between measuring it here and here so i guess like any tips for standardizing the exact yeah. location i mean is it and just it, like diligence like how do you do it it's and that's super important and i think that's a that's an easy pitfall early on when you're doing this you get to see one of the questions that you're always answering is do i trust the data that i'm getting and if you're noticing that small movement i mean the first time you're doing it when you're first doing this evaluation you get a bad signal I can't get a good signal. This is out. I'm getting a signal and it's varying greatly because the patient's breathing so much. You know, they're breathing 35 right. times a minute in the total volume. And that will like move the heart and it'll move right. like and that's gonna affect relationship your... to the heart based off of breathing. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of variabilities that in my opinion, exclude this from being clinically applicable. Just like the example you gave, if you do it and you realize there's very, very uh, big differences in subtle movement of your gait. Maybe it's not the mm -hmm. right test. Maybe you're just going to have to put that swan in. I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, and I think, that's I a, mean, that's, that's a good point. You got to be cognizant yeah. of the limitations. Um, and yeah. Again, and I mean, it, the more, the more you average, you know, the bigger your sample size is, I think you're going to come to oh, a, that's a good. mean. Um, and like then when that. you do your intervention, you can compare your mean. So I usually recommend doing a couple of these, never just trusting one single trace if you're doing it manually. That's uh, that's brilliant because I mean, if you just do one trace, I mean, it's almost like using the CVP, right? It's a static measurement, and it, it might be better if you got like a bunch to like average it out and stuff. Yeah. I I also want to say one other point, um, and that's that I don't. The more I practice, um, and the more patients I have to see, the more I like. I don't have such a hard time with the IVC, and the reason for that is for sure the um, the VTI is the best test if we can get a good signal, right? Um, but I think the CVP can help kind of push one way or the other as long as you understand that the question that the IVC is answering, which is surrogate markup CVP, is just that. What is the CVP at this moment? It doesn't yeah. say anything about volume responsiveness. It doesn't say if you give fluids, the patient's, you know, 
blood pressure will improve or worsen. It's just, this is what it is right now. And I still think that that's an, a good data point, not the best data point, but I think if you have that along with how does the patient look, what are the vitals? What did the lab show? What is the, the patient's history? If you put all that together, like you can make do just fine. I always say like, you should never use the ultrasound in, in isolation, yep. right? It's like something Absolutely. that you use along with everything else that you've learned as a medical provider. And it yep. sounds like same thing with BTI. Yep. And you know, I, I ask for a transduced CVP sometimes in the ICU because I know that if it's a certain extreme and really struggling that hard, then mm -hmm. one of these extremes will actually help me. Inevitably, it's always nine. And I'm like, well, that was, <laughs> It's that was always like, right in the middle. <laughs> and I was like, this, this doesn't help me at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the extremes are always going to be more helpful. Um, and this mm -hmm. is great. It's, uh, it's another dat data point. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to chat with me about this amazing topic. Cool. Looking forward to the next one. What an amazing time learning from Dr. Taryn Schott about the Velocity Time Integral. I'm so happy to have him on the podcast. Every time he's on, I have such a great time. I learn so much. I'm going to be using the Velocity Time Integral in my sickest patients. I need to use it more, and it's a great reminder about really how to utilize it and how simple it can be. Don't forget to check out the Ultrasound Leadership Academy at ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com, our courses on the courses.coreultrasound.com, and our free content on the YouTube and on the website. Hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.